Here it is, folks. The Crackdown Season 2 finale. It's been a wild ride, and in true Crackdown fashion, this week has been crazier than all the ones before it. Are you ready? North Korea is back at it with weapons tests. Ebola is back, the Notre Dame Cathedral caught on fire, and a bunch of Instagram passwords leaked. And we're not talking about any of that stuff, because this week, the Mueller report dropped. It was way spicier than we expected. So we're giving you the big, huge summary that you need to get through the tough times ahead. Because trust us, people are going to be talking about this for a while. From WHIP News, I'm Tony Pearson, and this is your WHIP Weekly News Crackdown Season 2 Finale. On Thursday, April 18th at roughly 11 a.m., the Department of Justice released the full-length redacted Mueller report to the public. Since then, the country has been in a frenzy interpreting its findings, especially because Attorney General William Barr, who released his own summary of the report weeks ago, left out a lot of relevant information. We're going to summarize the biggest and broadest points of the report here, but it's really long and complex. It comes in two volumes. The first covers the investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. The second volume covers the investigation into potential obstruction of justice by the president. In the description, you'll find a link to the full report, as well as a bulleted summary of volume two, completed by myself, as volume two has been more controversial. If you'd like to listen to that summary in full, you can do so on a Friday's episode of Rational Radio, also linked in the description. So first, let's discuss volume one of the report on Russian election interference. Volume one establishes that the Russian government interfered in the 2016 election in a quote, sweeping and systematic fashion, citing evidence that began to surface in mid 2016. This effort occurred principally through two operations. First, a Russian entity named the Internet Research Agency, or IRA, carried out a social media campaign designed to provoke and amplify social and political discord in the United States. The group was based in St. Petersburg, Russia, and received funding from a Russian oligarch with ties to Russian President Vladimir Putin. The IRA referred to its use of social media and interest groups to destabilize the U.S. as, quote, information warfare. This campaign evolved from a general program targeting U.S. electoral systems in 2014 and 2015 into a campaign that actively promoted Trump and disparaged Clinton. The IRA faked identities, organized fake rallies, and at times made contact with the Trump campaign posing as grassroots organizers. The investigation ultimately did not find evidence that any U.S. persons conspired or coordinated with this group. Second, and simultaneously, a Russian intelligence service known as the Main Intelligence Directorate of the General Staff of the Russian Army, or GRU, began a concerted effort to hack the email accounts of volunteers and employees of the Clinton campaign. It stole hundreds of thousands of documents in this way before disseminating them through the fictitious online personas of DC Leaks and Guccifer 2.0. The GRU later released additional materials through the organization WikiLeaks. These later leaks were welcomed by then candidate Trump and his campaign. At one point, the president even announced that he hoped Russia would recover emails missing from a private server used by Clinton while she was Secretary of State. WikiLeaks began releasing the relevant emails on October 7th, 2016, less than one hour after a U.S. media outlet released video considered damaging to candidate Trump. Throughout this period, Trump campaign officials made a series of contacts with individuals tied to the Russian government, including business connections and offers of assistance to the campaign. The investigation established that the Russian government perceived it would benefit from a Trump presidency and worked to secure that outcome. The investigation also established that the Trump campaign expected to benefit electorally from information stolen and released through these Russian efforts. The report notes that the investigation established that several Trump campaign individuals lied to the office and to Congress about their interactions with Russian affiliates and related matters. Some of the individuals under investigation also deleted relevant communications before they could be obtained. 
The report notes that these issues materially impaired the investigation and that it was unable to paint a full picture of what actually happened. Given all of this, Mueller concluded that he could not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the Trump campaign conspired or coordinated with the Russian government. Mueller declined to bring charges against Trump or his campaign on those grounds. Volume two of the Mueller report is where things get especially interesting. Because here, unlike in volume one, Mueller did not make a traditional decision. Mueller describes four considerations that influenced this volume of the report on pages one and two. First, Mueller specifically chose not to make a traditional prosecutorial decision, either to issue an indictment or to decline further prosecution because official office guidelines prevent him from indicting a sitting president. Second, he cites statutory and case law that establishes the president can be subjected to a criminal investigation and that the president is not immune after he leaves office. His third and fourth points are especially noteworthy because they provide context to Mueller's decision that Barr left out of his summary. Mueller's third point describes more specifically why he would not issue a formal decision. He notes that if he formally accuses the president of a crime while he is still in office, the president cannot be indicted. This means he cannot stand trial and cannot be afforded an opportunity to defend himself officially. As a result, Mueller notes that accusing the president of obstruction while he's in office could violate his rights to due process. With this in mind, Mueller notes one last consideration. In his fourth point, Mueller specifically states that the lack of a decision is not a statement that there is no evidence the president obstructed justice. Mueller notes that if he had confidence given the facts that the president did not obstruct justice, he would make that declaration. He does not. Instead, he states that, quote, the evidence obtained about the president's actions and intent presents difficult issues that prevent us from conclusively determining that no criminal conduct occurred. Accordingly, while this report does not conclude that the president committed a crime, it also does not exonerate him. In short, Mueller is stating here that he is not able to make the call as to whether or not the president obstructed justice, because doing so would be premature and could even violate the president's constitutional rights. Instead, Mueller explicitly made a non-statement. If the president is to receive a fair trial, he needs to be impeached first, or his term needs to end. Congress is going to have to use the details in the report to decide what to do. Those details are extremely complex, but we're going to try to cover the very basics. So let's get into those basics. First, Mueller defines the relevant crimes he is investigating using a litany of statutory and case laws. These are obstruction of justice, attempts or endeavors to obstruct justice, and witness tampering. Mueller defines obstruction of justice as consisting of three elements. First, it requires an obstructive act, conduct capable of producing an effect that prevents justice from being duly administered. Second, it requires that act to be directly related in some way to an ongoing investigation. Third, the act must have corrupt intent. This means that the person being investigated must have acted with intent to gain an improper advantage for himself or someone else, inconsistent with that person's official duty and the rights of others. Mueller defines an attempt to obstruct justice as a quote, overt act that constitutes a substantial step toward obstruction. And he notes that asking an innocent agent to engage in obstructive conduct could qualify. And an endeavor to obstruct justice, on the other hand, is more broad. It merely requires that some corrupt effort to obstruct justice is made, regardless of that effort's success. Finally, Mueller defines witness tampering as engaging in conduct toward another person with the intent to influence, delay, or prevent their testimony to an official proceeding or law enforcement officer. Mueller notes that this does not have to be violent or coercive. It can include telling a witness to lie, arguing with a witness, coaching or reminding a witness by planting misleading facts, telling potential witnesses a false story as though it is true, intending them to testify to it, urging a witness to recall a fact they do not know, even if said fact is true, or urging a witness not to cooperate with law enforcement with improper motive. Throughout the rest of the report, Mueller notes 11 subject areas in which the president may have committed crimes. 
let's talk about them. These are one, the Trump campaign's response to initial reports about Russian support for Trump, in which Trump publicly denied having business in Russia, despite knowing this was a lie. Two, Trump's conduct involving FBI Director James Comey and former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. Flynn lied to a variety of officials, including the Vice President and the FBI, about his talks with the Russian ambassador. After Trump was made aware of this, he tried to divert FBI Director Comey away from investigating Flynn. Three, Trump's reaction to the continuing investigation, in which he tried to get former Attorney General Jeff Sessions to unrecuse himself on multiple occasions. He also pressured Comey to exonerate him, despite being advised not to by White House counsel Donald McGahn. Four, Trump then fired Comey, stating in the following days to Russian officials and a national TV audience that the Russia investigation influenced his decision to, quote, just do it. Five, the appointment of the special counsel and the president's efforts to remove him. After the special counsel was appointed, Trump directed White House counsel McGahn to order Sessions to fire the counsel. McGahn disobeyed this order. Six, two days later, further efforts to curtail the special counsel's investigation in which the president twice tried to get officials to focus the investigation on future elections, not his own. 7. His efforts to prevent public disclosure of evidence, in which he edited a press statement by his son to lie about the nature of a meeting at Trump Tower, then denied his involvement. 8. Further efforts to have Sessions retake control of the investigation, despite his past recusal. These were unsuccessful. 9. The president then attempted to make McGahn deny that he had been ordered by the president to have the special counsel removed. Recall point number 5. McGahn refused to back away from his recollection of the events. 10. The president's conduct toward Flynn, Paul Manafort, and another classified individual. The president made public and private attempts to contact and influence both of these named individuals while they were talking to investigators. Finally, 11. The president's conduct involving his personal lawyer, Michael Cohen. Cohen lied to Congress about the extent of his efforts to pursue the Trump Tower Moscow project at the direction of Trump's personal counsel to, quote, stay on message. As Cohen was investigated, the president originally supported him with public assertions that he would not flip, as well as private messages of support. When Cohen did flip, the president publicly criticized him, calling him a rat and notably suggesting that his family had committed crimes. All of these events have details relevant to the laws laid out by Mueller. The descriptions above are extremely short summaries. The bulk of volume two of the report is focused on the details and evidence surrounding these events. Congress and the American public need to decide whether this evidence is sufficient to charge the president because Mueller has explicitly stated he cannot legally do so. If so, the president cannot be charged until he is impeached, which is why Mueller declined to draw a firm conclusion. The limited conclusion Mueller did draw was this. Trump's actions can be divided into two phases. The first is the period before he fired Comey, during which he did not think he was the subject of the investigation. The second is the period after he fired Comey, at which point he became aware he was a target of the investigation. During the second phase, the president engaged in public attacks on the investigation, non-public efforts to control it, and efforts in both public and private to encourage witnesses not to cooperate. Here, Mueller concluded that judgments about the nature of the president's motives during each phase should be informed by the totality of the evidence he has collected. If you want to make that judgment or engage in that debate, you know what to do. The report is in the description. But what you cannot do is pretend this isn't happening. This is no longer speculation. The former Nothing Burger now has meat on it and we need to decide what it means and what to do with it. American principles dictate that nobody is above the law. That includes the president. Proceed with caution, fellow Americans. Thank you all for watching this Crackdown season finale and special on the Mueller report. The report ended up being way more complex than we'd anticipated. A bunch of other stuff happened this week that unfortunately got pushed out. But this report is extremely important to American democracy, and we wanted to give you our best shot at summarizing its contents. 
From WHIP News, I'm Tony Pearson, signing off for the last time. I've got to go graduate. Like, subscribe, and share if you enjoyed this content, and please come back in the fall for more WHIP Weekly News Crackdowns.